So in the previous video, I introduced this game called the no triangle game, where we start out with some number of vertices, four in this example, and we connect all the vertices with edges. The edges are either red or blue, and our big goal is to avoid monochromatic triangles, so a red triangle or a blue triangle. And we learned we can play this game on more than four vertices. We looked at it in four vertices. We looked at it with five vertices. And we even looked at it with six vertices, but quickly learned that we can't possibly win the game on six vertices. That led us to Ramsey theory, which is really just a generalization of that no triangle game that allows us to talk about slightly more complicated versions of that game. And then I got a little sidetrack showing you pictures that I think are cool that maybe you don't need. But now what I want to do is get back on track. Back on track towards my goal of talking about Graham's number is getting back to two colored graphs. So not three colored graphs anymore. So what we're going to do is we're going to play a similar game to the no triangle game. Except now, instead of just starting out with eight vertices, we're gonna start out with eight vertices that are kind of structured. We're gonna start talking about the eight vertices of a cube. And again, because it's two colored, we can think of all of our edges as either being red or blue. And what the question is now, is can we avoid a monochromatic planar K4? So first off, a reminder that K4, not K3, it's not the no triangle game, it's the no, I don't know what to call these things, kind of squares with an X's through them game. And so what we're going to try to do is color in all these edges with either red or blue lines, but avoid one of these, but not just one of these, one of these that all lie on a plane. So what I mean is like this guy, this guy, and this guy, and then this guy down here would not be planar. You cannot connect those four dots with the plane. You couldn't take a piece of paper and orient it in such a way without folding it or anything that those four guys all landed on the same piece of paper. So that's why it's important that we start out with the cube in the first place, because we're going to not just talk about K4, but planar versions of K4. And so the question is, can you avoid a monochromatic planar K4? Absolutely you can, right? Because a few slides ago, I said that the cutoff for having any K4 at all, I didn't even worry about a planar K4, but any K4 at all was when M equals 18. I said that if you had 17 vertices, a complete two colored graph on 17 vertices, you could avoid a K4. That was a few slides ago. So if you can avoid any K4 with 17 vertices, you can certainly avoid any K4 when you only have eight vertices. And if you can avoid any K4, well then you're definitely avoid, you're avoiding all the K4s, so you're definitely avoiding all the planar K4s. So this is an absolutely true statement, although it's not very satisfying for someone to just tell you that it's true. So what I wanna do is explore that question a little bit more. First, I wanna draw you a picture. I wanna start out with the cube and create all the different edges that I can with pairs of those eight vertices and then color them in either red or blue. And I first wanna do it in such a way that there is a monochromatic K4. So my question is, can you find it? Like search for it. Can you find four vertices that all lie on the same plane that are all connected with the same color that create this K4 subgraph? And it exists. You might wanna pause it and look for it or if you're not that interested, don't, because here it is. You see it? You kinda of see it right there? It's going sort of diagonal. It's all on a plane for sure. It connects this vertex, this vertex, this vertex, and this vertex. At any rate, there is a monochromatic K4. However, if I take this edge down here at the bottom and I switch it, right now it's red and it's part of that monochromatic planar K4. If I switch it to blue, then I will no longer have a monochromatic K4. What is currently pictured is an example, a counter example, an example showing that it's possible to have a complete graph on eight vertices, a two colored complete graph on eight vertices that does not contain a monochromatic K4. Check it, try to find one, you won't be able to find one. If you're really observant, you might notice that I called it a three-dimensional cube. And you're like, wait a minute, aren't all cubes three-dimensional? Well, yeah, actually all cubes are three-dimensional. So why did I make a big point about this cube being three-dimensional? Well, to be able to talk about Graham's number, we're gonna have to talk about analogs to cubes that are not three dimensional. We're gonna have to get into four dimensions and it'll turn out a lot more than four dimensions. What I wanna talk about now are what are called N dimensional hypercubes. A zero dimensional hypercube, it turns out it's just a point. A one dimensional hypercube, it's just a line segment connecting two points. A two dimensional hypercube is a little bit more cubey looking in that it's a square. And a three dimensional hypercube is just a cube. You're probably familiar with all these names. You might be less familiar with this name, a tesseract. A tesseract is a four-dimensional hypercube. Tesseract, it shows up in like science fiction all the time. That movie Interstellar, at the end when, uh, who, what's that dude's name? Matthew McConaughey supposedly falls into a black hole and then he ends up in this weird thing where he can like see his daughter's bookshelves and stuff. Remember that scene? Yeah, when he's in there, he's like, oh, I'm in this giant tesseract. 
They threw the word Tesseract around in that movie. And it shows up in a bunch of different movies that are trying to be all sci-fi fancy because it's kind of a cool word. A four-dimensional hypercube is a Tesseract. And I want to explain a little bit about what a Tesseract looks like. And in order to do so, I'm going to show you some pictures, but really the statement that I'll have to reference is this one. And what it says is to get from any dimension to the next, all you got to do is take two copies of the last dimension where one is moved perpendicularly one unit and then connect the copied vertices. And you're like, what are you talking about? We need some pictures. Well, let me show you some pictures. A point is a zero dimensional hypercube. A line segment is a one-dimensional hypercube. If I want to go from a point to a line segment, what I do is I start out with this, my zero-dimensional hypercube, and I make a copy of it. So instead of having one point, I have two points. And I have to take one of the points and move it one unit perpendicularly away from this point. And if you're good with zero dimensions, you might be like, that's impossible. You have zero dimensions, you have nowhere to move it. So what I need to do is I need to jump up to one dimension, so think like a number line, and then I can move it a distance of one away. And if I connect all the different copies, remember these were both copies of this original dot, so I need to connect them. What I end up with is a one dimensional hypercube. Although nobody would ever call this a one dimensional hypercube, they call it a line segment. Technically, it's a one dimensional hypercube. And if I wanted to create a two dimensional hypercube, which is a square, and everyone calls it a square, but technically it's a two dimensional hypercube, I'd make a copy of this, so I have two copies total, and I'd take one of those copies and move it one unit away from this copy, but perpendicular. And you're like, what do you mean, like one unit this way? No, perpendicular. Well, I can't move it perpendicular if I'm living in one dimension. If I'm on the number line, I can't move it up and down. So what I gotta do is move up to two dimensions, and then I can move it one unit perpendicular. So here's my first copy of a one-dimensional hypercube. Here is my other copy of the one-dimensional hypercube. And what I wanted to do is take the second copy and move it one unit perpendicular from the first copy. And note that if this is a copy of this, this vertex here is a copy of this vertex, and this vertex here is a copy of this vertex, and that's why with green lines, I'm connecting that pair and this pair right here. I can create a two-dimensional hypercube from a one-dimensional hypercube. And similarly, I could take this guy and create a three-dimensional hypercube, and maybe now you're getting the hang of it. I'm gonna copy this square, and I'm gonna move it perpendicularly one unit away from this square. And you're like, you can't move it left and right, because then it wouldn't be perpendicular, and you can't move it up and down. Maybe I could move it like one unit closer to me. Well, yeah, you could if only you had three dimensions. Or you can move it one unit in, I don't know, the z-axis. Here's my first copy in the background here of my two-dimensional hypercube. Here's my new copy of the two-dimensional hypercube. And note that in blue, I connected all the pairs of copied vertices. So you're like, all right, these are, this is the limit of everything that I know. I mean, that's not really true. But as far as hypercubes, these are the three that you're familiar with. But maybe with this background, we could talk about a four-dimensional hypercube, aka a tesseract. Warning, spoiler alert maybe, I'm not going to be able to draw it for you. Because we live in this three-dimensional world, I can't draw something in four dimensions. But I could kind of sort of draw a picture that maybe will kind of give you the idea of what it looks like. I would take this cube, I'd make a copy of it. Here it is over here. And I would have to move it, and here's the tricky part, one unit perpendicular from this cube. I think orthogonal is technically the right word for me to use, but I'm going to use perpendicular because I think more people are more familiar with that. And you're like, how do you move it perpendicular away from this? Well, you can't in three dimensions. can't move it up or down or left or right or towards me or away from me. can't do any of that. So in this three-dimensional world that we live in, I have nowhere to move my cube. The copy of this cube, I got nowhere to put it. But if I were lucky enough to live in four dimensions, then I could just move this one unit in that fourth dimension and connect all the different paired vertices and what I would end up with is something that kind of looks like this and it's a hypercube. And when I say kind of looks like this, I mean as good as I can draw a four dimensional thing in three dimensions. But what you might want to take from this is this new Tesseract would have what, 16 vertices? Have the eight that I have over here and an additional eight that I have over here. What about edges? Well, my original cube had 12 edges, right? Four going around the front, four going around the back and four connecting front to back. So I got 12 edges here and another 12 edges here but I also have to connect my pairs of matched vertices. So that's gonna create an extra eight. I think I'm gonna have 12 plus 12 plus eight. I'm gonna end up with 32 edges in my Tesseract. So you can kind of come up with some different properties. We could talk about faces of a Tesseract. You can come up with formulas for like volume or the four dimensional version of volume and surface area and all that stuff. Tesseracts are really interesting and you can study them a lot. All I wanted to do is kind of scratch the surface of what a Tesseract is so I can talk about a four dimensional hypercube. 
Before I leave Tesseracts, I'd be remiss if I didn't show you a couple of the animations that I found on Wikipedia. I did not make these, but this is kind of an animation doing the same argument I made. We start out with the point, made it a line, made it a square, made it a cube as we're moving through dimensions. And then here's how it kind of tries to picture what four dimensions would look like. It doesn't really have anywhere to move this because again, it's a three dimensional thing. So it kind of puts it in the middle, but that's the idea of how you create a Tesseract. What I think was interesting is this is kind of what it would look like if you were rotating in four dimensions a Tesseract. Kind of, I mean, as best we can do in this three dimensional world that we live in. In the next video, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go back to that game that we played earlier, where we tried to connect all of the vertices of a cube with red and blue edges and not have a monochromatic planar K4. This game right here, you might be like, wait, why are we playing that game? That's dumb, we already won that game. Well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna play that game on hypercubes, not just on this cube. And you might be like, whoa, this is getting a little bit too abstract for me. I don't really understand hypercubes. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do that. Don't worry. This is the last level of abstraction. We're finally at the point where we can pose the question to which Graham's answer will be the number. And we'll get into that in the next video.